Good morning, guys. What a joy it is um, that we could gather around God's word today as God's men. Thank you for taking the time. And we know that, you know, some of you are running tomorrow and you decided to use today as just rest, feed on God's word that will sustain you tomorrow as you run. And many of us will be praying for you and will be watching you. And for those of you who, who do not know me, my name is Jomo. I am the rector here, part of the team, Christ Church Hillcrest. And so it is my privilege really to, to host you this morning. These men gathering, you know, as if you've noticed our leaflet there, we have one purpose, and that purpose is to encourage you to live for Christ. We understand the pressure that you, you face as men, be it at work, at home, you know, many of you are leading in your fields, your managers, and the pressure is on, and the pressure to compromise is ever increasing. And this is a good moment for us to, as God's men to be together, to pray together, to sing together, to hear God speaking to us, addressing issues that are specifically related to us. And this morning would be no different. God will speak to us and God will lead us. So as we start, I would like to start with Psalm 1, which many of you probably know of by heart, by now. So Psalm 1, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sins, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the Lord, in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yield its fruit in its season and its leaves does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father and our eternal God, we bow our hearts and our heads before you, our loving Father, our mighty God. We pray that you, you would guide this gathering that we will hear you speak directly to us this morning. And we ask that you would quieten our hearts and we will not allow the busyness of life, the things we're planning to do after this convention or tomorrow, we won't allow those things to cloud our thinking this morning that would open our minds and our hearts to hear you speak. That we allow your word to sink deep in our hearts and to renew our minds this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let me welcome Jeff officially. It is good to see you, my brother, in the promised land. The land that after creation God 
looked at the dragon snake, looked at the sea, and kissed KZN twice. <laughs> and sent all the European weather to Cape Town. So, <laughs> what a joy it is um, to, to be with you. I know Jeff, um, when I was a student at GWC, I was placed at St. Stephen's. And Jeff was new, they had just come, it's been a year or so, and his son and my son, Tim and Sia, used to play together. So it's been many, many years of gospel partnership um, with, with Jeff. And the great news is that, is that Jeff just graduated with a PhD in homiletics. So, congratulations, my brother. And for the layman, that means he has a PhD in the art of preaching. All right. So, so we, we really are looking forward to hear what God um, say, has to say to us this morning through you, my brother. And thank you for coming. So I'm going to ask Jonathan, who will bring um, the reading to us. Are we reading from John 13? Good morning. Oh, yeah. I didn't realize they adjusted the height of the pulpit for Bishop, so <laughs> I need to take my glasses off. <laughs> if you don't have your Bibles with you, uh, you can listen as I read from the ESV, John chapter 13, and I'm going to be reading from verse 1 to 17. This is the Word of God. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing, you do not understand now. But afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you are right, for so am I, so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. This is the reading of God's word. Well, good morning, everyone. Sorry, have I just got deaf for, uh, for you? Uh, yeah. Actually, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is wonderful to be with you. Good to be here today. Uh, first, uh, uh, just a little apology. I got up this morning and realized I'd left my razor at home. But then I thought, well, a conference on manliness doesn't really matter if you've got a little bit of extra facial hair. And I see I've got some colleagues with some facial hair, so that's a. Uh, that's, that's good. Wonderful to be with you today. I did expect you to put on some weather for me. Not Cape Town weather. This is Cape Town weather. 
thought it would be nice and warm. Anyway, let me stop waffling. I'm going to pray, then we're going to get stuck into our passage together. Won't you pray with me? Our Father Almighty, we pray that today we might hear your voice. Won't you be with us? Won't you challenge us? Won't you change us? Most of all, we pray, will you make us like Christ? Help us to hear your voice and to obey it today, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, I thought this morning I would begin with a survey. So I'd like to know what you think. So I'd like you to put up your right hand if you think that it is Kelsey. I'd like you to put up your left hand if you think that it is Kels. And I'd like you to put up both hands if you have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about at all. <laughs> Most of you have got both hands up. <laughs> you have no cooking clue whether it is Kels or Kelsey. Well, let's see if I can get the projector working. Let's see if we can get him up. Here he is. That's the wrong way. There he is. I'm speaking, of course, of Travis Kelsey. Rather confusingly, he calls himself Kelsey, while his family uses the pronunciation Kels. He is, of course, Taylor Swift's boyfriend. <laughs> now, if you've never heard of Taylor Swift, <laughs> well, probably she is the biggest music star in the world at the moment. She has a mere 283 million followers on Instagram. Hands up if you've got a million followers on Instagram. I don't, you don't need to do that. 95 million followers on X and a paltry 57 million subscribers on YouTube. We've got 600 subscribers on our YouTube channel. It'd be nice if you subscribed to my YouTube channel. Take us a little bit closer to her. Uh, her recent concert series in the U.S. caused a congressional inquiry when people were unable to obtain tickets. Well, Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey are dating. He is the Kansas City Chiefs' tight end. You can come and tell me over coffee if you are big in American football. But if American football is not your thing and you're tempted to be rude about the name tight end... Just remember that in rugby, a tight head and a loose head scrum on either side of a hooker. <laughs> I don't really know what a tight end does in the NFL. I don't think it really matters. He's got something to do with blocking and catching and passing, which pretty much sounds like most football, doesn't it? Travis Kelsey is considered by many to be one of the greatest tight ends ever. Now, the reason I begin our conference today with Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift is because she calls him a soft jock. Do you know what a soft jock is? A soft jock is a manly man. I see many here. A man with a manly beard. A man with biceps the size of a rugby ball who's also sensitive and kind and generally nice. The online women's magazine Bustle just defines a soft jock as someone with masculine physique, but their insides are sensitive, non-threatening, and they're in touch with their feminine side. Of course, we have our own soft jock. Sorry. Oh, I forgot to give you the picture. There she, there she is. We, of course, have our own soft jock. Yeah, he is. Captain, our captain. You don't want to be tackled by Sia Kulisi, do you? At full tilt, he will probably put most of us into hospital. He can bench press 150 kilograms and squat nearly 220 kilograms. Just for reference sake, I am 88 kilograms on a good day. When I'm lying to myself, 90 kilograms for most of the time. He can bench press me with one hand. But he's also, well, he's so nice, isn't he? He's just 
nice. Off the field, his marriage seems spectacular. His parenting seems wonderful. A soft jock. Well, now that you've mastered the term soft jock, let me introduce you to another. It is the term metrosexual. A few decades ago, metrosexual was the phrase that every man was aspiring to be. The poster boy for metrosexuals was David Beckham. I got this picture from his fragrance website. Anyone else got a fragrance named after them? None of you guys this morning. Come on. We are not doing well. I got this picture, as I said, from his website. The term metrosexual describes a heterosexual man's man. A man in touch with his masculinity, who is at the same time meticulous and scrupulous about his personal styling, grooming, and appearance. A metrosexual is a man who uses water toilet. <laughs> Say it with me. Water <laughs> toilet. <laughs> and who has manicured nails, but like the bishop, really. <laughs> <laughs> Which bishop we ask? <laughs> well, today, now time to get it, men. We are considering the subject of manliness. Thanks for being here. Thanks for taking some time to invest in your soul. Today, we're considering what is manliness? What does it mean to be a real man? To be a biblical man? To be a man after God's heart. I don't think that our world is terribly sure about manliness anymore. If it ever was. We, we aren't sure if manliness is even something to be aspired to. There are lots of options proposed about manliness. There's Travis Kelsey, there's Sia Colisi, there's David Beckham. And then there is the masculinity of, of Andrew Tate. You haven't heard of uh, Taylor Swift. I doubt you've heard of Andrew Tate, but he's a British American former professional kickboxer with a massive social media fo media following. In August 2022, The Guardian reported that videos of Tate on TikTok had been viewed 11.6 billion times. Not million, billion. He was the third most Googled person in 2023. So we're not talking about small fry here. He preaches a, mes a message of aggressive masculinity. He describes himself as both a sexist and a misogynist. If you don't know what misogynist is, that's just somebody who dislikes women. He and his brother Tristan are presently currently banned from leaving Romania, where they are set to stand trial on charges of human trafficking. They also face extradition charges to the UK for sexual aggression. So is what Andrew Tate proposes... Manliness. And then what about the manliness we see in our political system? And haven't we had an interesting few days? Politically. You've had a very interesting few days politically. Our, our political leaders display varying models of manliness. You can see if you can work out which is which, there is the aggressive. The confrontational, the flag burning, the gun shooting, the sexually dominant, the angry, there's the hesitant and the uncertain. There are those that espouse and propagate alternate sexualities and varied models of polygamy. So my question to you today is a simple one. What does it mean to be a man? It's a question we're asking God. Because at the end of the day, it's only his opinion that matters. Of course, we're going to find his opinion in the pages of the scriptures, and we're going there to find out what God wants. We're going there to know God, to find God, to hear God. The more we know God, the more our lives are going to make sense. The more we know God, the more we'll know how to be men in this world. What is manliness? What does it mean to be a man? 
That's our journey today. What should we be aiming for? What should we be teaching to our sons and our grandsons? What should we admire, respect, aspire to? How does manliness affect our sex lives? Yes, we're even going to talk about sex today. What sort of a man are you aiming to become? What sort of a man does God want us to be? So, welcome to Mastering Manliness. We've got three sessions today. In each session, I'm just going to give us one word to consider. A single word. This session, the word I want us to consider is the word lead. Lead. But before we get there, before we get to manliness, before we get to leading, let's talk about God. So what I want you to do is I want you to lean over to your neighbor and grunt a greeting to them. Then, I want you to say to them the first word that comes into your mind about God. Okay, so I'll model for you. You just watch me, lean over to the guy next to you, and you grunt at them. So you go, hey. Or you go, oh. Or you go, so Or you go, yeah, boy. Or you go, something like that. Just a grunt. Oh. And then the first thing that comes into your mind about God. God is good. Do it. Lean over to your neighbor, grunt, and then the first word that comes to your mind. <laughs> Hope you met someone new. Now, I'm pretty sure that some of you grunted words about power. When you went for describing God, first word that came into your mouth, into your mind about God, might be words like mighty, nkulu, majestic, eternal, okwapakadi. Perhaps some of you said creator, infinite, everlasting, namandla, potent. God is definitely strong, powerful. Whatever you do, don't make the mistake of thinking of God as small or insignificant. God is, God is great. Now, others of you might have gone for words describing the goodness of God. You, you might have thought of gracious or compassionate or, or slow to anger or bounding in love or merciful or kind or, or forgiving. What a, what, a, what a tremendous joy it is to know that God is not capricious or nasty or mean or grumpy. Like we so often are. Am I alone? Come, come, we're amongst friends. We can be honest with each other. It's a safe place. We can tell the truth. Do, do you, like me, some days just want to be grumpy? <laughs> some days you wake up and you're like, yeah, I'm just grumpy today. <laughs> I, just, I just don't want to be nice to <laughs> Perhaps that's every day. That might be a problem if it's every day. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? To know God is not like us, not like me. He's good and he's, he's gracious and he's kind and he's forgiving. A third option that some of you might have grunted at each other it might have been words describing God in, in, in terms of his wisdom. His knowledge. He has a truth to, to meditate on fairly regularly. God knows everything. There's nothing that God doesn't know. 
God doesn't even have to wait on the future to find out what is going to happen because he already knows the future because he's already there. Starting to see smoke coming out of one or two of your ears. That's good. That's obviously one or two brains that are working. <laughs> he, he knows what we're going to do tomorrow even when we don't know what we're going to do tomorrow ourselves. His absolute knowledge of everything. He knows how long you're going to live. He knows when you're going to die. He knows how human history ends because he's already there. Now, let me just give you a little illustration to help you to try and understand how this works, how to, how to comprehend how God can possibly be in the present and the future at the same time. You'll know that light takes just over eight minutes to get from the sun to the earth. So if your sun explodes right now at this very present moment, it'll take eight minutes before we realize that. Before that light gets to us. If you were big enough that you have one foot on the sun and one foot on the earth, then you could be in the future of the earth even as you're in the present of the sun. You see, that's how big God is. Just by virtue of his size, he's so big that he's even in the future. Which is the most brilliantly reassuring thought, isn't it? Whatever the future holds for KZN, God's already there. A fourth way that you might have used, you might have thought to describe God in your grunt, is by using the word Trinity. Uzekus in the Bible teaches that God is three persons, but there's one God. And if you think about that too long, there will be smoke coming out of your ears, won't there? We are dealing with an infinite God. We must expect to not be able to easily understand Him. God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But there's only one God. The creeds put it like this, we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the person nor dividing the substance. The clergy amongst us this morning will explain that to you over coffee. <laughs> <laughs> now as a general rule, men, for your life, you must think about God often. Every day. Multiple times in the day. It'll give perspective to your struggles, our worries, our cares, our pain, shrink when God is big in our thoughts. When we get big in our thoughts, then we act stupidly. And when we get big, we increasingly feel the pressure to be in control, but when we're small, we realize we don't need to be in control. When you're a child and you're small, your parents are big and you sleep easily. You remember those days as a child, no worries, no cares. Think often about God and you'll increasingly understand life, how it's made, how it works, how it all fits where you fit. Okay, now that we've started to think about God, let's start to think about manliness. About whether a soft jock or a metrosexual is what we should aspire to. Here's the primary implication of God in Trinity. God in Trinity means that the ultimate reality in the universe is relationships. God in Trinity means ordered relationships are central in the universe. You see, God is himself in relationship. He 
is, in his essence, relationship. And he has designed the universe to reflect him, himself, his character. He has a point at which African culture is far superior to Western culture. It treasures relationships. It values and prioritizes kinship. We call it Ubuntu. Western culture, on the other hand, treasures individualism. Me by myself. We esteem big, self-made men, but that sort of living is a horrible dead end. Because God is Trinity, is relationship. He's not the unconscious, unmoved mover of Aristotle, nor is he watching from a distance, needing the ancestors to mediate. He is instead Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in perfect, eternal relationship. He has a relationship within himself. And he creates us humans to mirror and reflect that. And not only to mirror and reflect it, but to enjoy it. And then, these relationships, as you know the Trinity, are ordered. It's not a free-for-all. God in Trinity has an order within Himself. The Father loves the Son and gives all things to the Son. The Father shows the Son all that He does. The Son submits to the Father and always does what it, what, that which pleases the Father. He loves the Father and does what the Father desires, as does the Spirit. The Spirit is self-effacing. He doesn't speak of Himself or draw attention to Himself, but instead glorifies the Father and the Son. The Father leads the Son and the Spirit, and the Son and the Spirit submit to the Father, not as burden, but as joy. Each person loves the other. Each person shows kindness to the other. There's order in the Trinity. There's affection in the Trinity. And then God himself has made all of existence to reflect himself. Well, to help us understand, let me introduce you to another new word. It is the word petalak. Hands up if you know the definition of the word petalak. Hands up if you've never heard that word before in your life. Hands up if you're asleep. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's encouraging. Perhaps it's your neighbor who's snoring, telling me he should have had his hand up at this moment. I doubt that you've ever heard the word petalike, and so I've got some pictures to help you understand what it means. Here it is. <laughs> what do you reckon? Petalike. <laughs> Got it, haven't you? Petal like is the uncanny reality that owners and their pets often look the same. Even as I'm looking at you this morning, I'm seeing your pets. I'm seeing them. I'm seeing their facial hair or their books or their lack of facial hair. Petal like is the uncanny reality that owners and their pets often look the same. Now, whether that's because we are so narcissistic that we buy pets that look like us, you go into the shop and go, oh, that one's good looking, I'll have that one. <laughs> or whether it is that pets and owners actually grow to look the same. Well, that's not really certain. How's the truth for you to grasp? People will grow increasingly like the God that they serve. Which means that because God is in ordered relationship, then an essential component of manliness, real manliness in this world, is men growing in ordered relationships. I want to suggest to you this morning that God has made men to lead their relationships and their families. 
But here's the rub. Relationships are hard. And we're generally terrible at them. And we abdicate leading in relationships because leading is even harder. Which is one of the reasons why our world is such a mess. But God has made men as relational beings. And God has made men to be in ordered human relationships. And God has made men to lead in those relationships. God the Father leads the Trinity. And we are to grow like Him. And so let's think about leading for a few minutes. Perhaps, you, perhaps you're actually quite liking the idea of leading. You're visualizing yourself as, as the boss. Perhaps you're liking the idea of being in charge, of setting the agenda at home. You're thinking, yeah, I'm in for this. Or perhaps at this point you're thinking, oh, Jeff, you just don't know my wife. <laughs> this will never work in our home. I haven't got the energy to try and lead her. I far prefer happy wife, happy life. <laughs> There's no way I could lead. Well, come with me to Jerusalem, to the upper room, to the night before Jesus dies. We read it a few moments, uh, a few moments ago. It's John chapter thirteen. It's famous. You know it. You know it very well. It's, it, it, it says now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in this world. He loved them to the end. But during supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he'd come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. So picture the scene. It's a manly room. It's perhaps a bit like a, a, a locker room at, at, at Moses Mabida or at, or at King's Park or at, uh, perhaps like the start line tomorrow morning. There, there's lots of testosterone, uh, perhaps some manly jokes and some even, even some, some, some back slapping. Uh, there's a blissful unawareness of, of what is about to happen, what is about to transpire. Tomorrow Jesus dies. But Jesus... Knowing that all things are placed in his hands, that you and me, we are placed in the hands of Jesus. Knowing this, verse 4, he laid aside his outer garment, taking a towel, tied it round his waist. He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter and said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I'm doing you do not understand now, but afterwards you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not, not, not just my feet only, but also my hands and my feet, all of me. Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed doesn't need to, doesn't need to wash except for his feet. But he's completely clean and you're clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he washed their feet and put on his outer garment and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do not. Let's talk about feet for a few minutes. They're not the most presentable parts of our bodies, are they? 
We don't generally pray for our daughters to marry podiatrists. I'm sorry if you're a podiatrist this morning. Thank you for what you do. But it's not really the, 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 the job that people aspire to. Our feet get corns and they get calluses. They get horrible things called bunions and ingrown toenails. And often they... <laughs> they just stink, don't they? Suffice it to say that our feet are not the center of us. You don't stare at someone's feet when you meet them for the first time. You don't say as you're standing outside over coffee and you meet someone new, hello, how nice to meet you, looking at their feet. That would be just plain weird. I was recently gifted some pedicure stuff. Here it is, a couple that I married. I thought my wife and I needed pomegranate pedicure polishing sugar scrub with botanical oil extract to exfoliate, revitalize and soften. I can truthfully say, I, I, that before they, she gave this to us, I'd never even heard that this sort of stuff existed. Perhaps you've got some sorbet pedicure polishing sugar scrub in your house. I'm not judging you. We give a lot of attention to our teeth, don't we? And our hair. And our eyes. And our skin. And our biceps. We don't give that much attention to our feet. Perhaps it's because they complain so little. We stand on them all day. We run on them all day from Durban to Peter Maritzburg. Thank you for being here. You're running tomorrow. We pound them. We squash them into funny shaped shoes for the image. And for the most part, they don't complain awfully much. In John chapter 13, it's feet that are at the center of attention. That night with Jesus. They're having supper. It's an all-male affair. Testosterone flying around. When the alpha male, the undisputed leader of the pack, the big man in the group, gets up, takes off his dinner jacket, picks up a bowl of water, starts to wash these men's feet. It's a strange thing to do. It was a strange thing then, and it would be strange today if I stopped right now and started to wash your feet. If I did that right now, you'd go home and tell your families, you know, I just went to the weirdest gathering ever. <laughs> It'd just be an odd thing to do, wouldn't it? When I was growing up, my family attended a high Anglican church on the night. Some of you might have come from high Anglican backgrounds. On the night before Good Friday, there was a service where the minister used to do exactly this. He used to wash the feet of 12 representative men of the congregation. In the years when my dad was selected, I remember my mother lecturing my father to make sure that his feet were clean and that he didn't have holes in his socks <laughs> when he was called up to have his feet washed. D don't romanticize the scene. These feet are, are not clean washed socks kind of feet. These feet we're walking on the road outside after a soccer match, stinky, smelly, having run the comrades kind of feet. What was Jesus thinking? Why would he do such a thing? Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends, objects in the strongest possible terms. You're not washing my feet. Do you think he had corns on his feet or bunions or calluses or whatever? I don't know. If I don't wash you, you have to share with me, says Jesus. Well, then wash all of me. Must have been some awkwardness. As Jesus went from, from man to man, foot to foot. Perhaps a strange silence descended on the room. 
No one was laughing. No one was joking now. When it's all over, when Jesus has finished, when he's thrown out the water and put on his dinner, uh, dinner clothes again, he asked them, do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and that is right. That's a good thing. That's the right thing to do. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. What Jesus is doing is showing us what leadership looks like. What headship looks like for men. He shows us that God leads us by serving us. And he shows us that, that leading is serving. Of course, this foot washing is just a hint of what will take place the next day when he goes to the cross and he dies. Men, we call to be those sorts of leaders. To lead by serving. Just as God has done for us. Most of us want to live lives of significance. Henry David Toro, he's an American thinker from the last century, says that the mass of men instead live lives of quiet desperation. We want to make a difference, to leave a legacy. We want to count. We want to have an impact, to make a contribution. We want to be significant. We think fame might do it. We try stuff. We try raw power. But none of that lasts. I mean, can you name the richest man 50 years ago? Do you even care who was the richest man 50 years ago? Well, here's the way to leave a lasting legacy. Lead serving. Lead by serving. Let's get practical for a few minutes. Let's consider our families. Just think of them for a minute. Think of your family. Perhaps you left them at home in bed. Just say a little prayer for your family quite right now in your heart, quietly. And what your family's like? Is it messy? Oh, no messy families here today. Isn't that wonderful? Muddled? Yeah. Painful? Is there pain in your family? Do you know that your family will cry the biggest tears at your funeral? Now ask yourself this question. How might you lead them by serving them and right now, where are you leading them to? Fathers, let me remind you of the power that a father has in the life of their sons and daughters. One writer put it like this. From time to time, I have felt for my father a longing that was almost physical. Something infantile, something profound. It's bewildered me, even thrown me into depression. It's mysterious to me exactly what it is I wanted from my father. I've seen this longing in other men and see it now in my sons. They're longing for me. A boy wants the aura and armament of his father. It's a deep yearning. A terrible and solemn fact is that as fathers, we either grace our children or damn them with wounds that they carry forever. Men, you have such power in the lives of your children. Just by virtue of being their father. That's the challenge of God. Use it to serve them. Our world is full of women who have longed for the affirmation of a father and never got it. And full of men who carry great wounds because their fathers never showed up in their lives. <coughs> never took the effort to say, I'm so proud of you. 
Whole segments of society are bereft of male leadership. It's not that men can't lead. Because these same men are the, are the same men who give their best years of their lives to the marketplace. It's just that they won't show up in the lives of their children. You cannot lead and serve by proxy. Be present in the lives of your children. And ask yourself, where am I leading them to? Are we leading them towards God? Towards Christ? Towards eternity? I've been at St. Stephen's Church in Claremont in Cape Town for 23 years. Can I tell you how families join our church? I've been there long enough to have worked out that this is how it works in our community. In the first week, mom comes to church. In the second week, she brings the children. And in the third week, she brings him. There are just so many things wrong with that picture, aren't there? He's absent. He's abdicated any form of spiritual leadership for his family. He's not leading nor serving. He's usually investing in himself on a Sunday morning. This week I was praying for Guadalupe. I don't even know if that's how you say it. I, I sometimes pray using the Operation World app, but this week Guadalupe, the island, came up uh, to pray for. Any idea, anyone know what Guadalupe is? Anyone been to Guadalupe? It's up in the West Indies there, near the other West Indian islands. This is what Operation World said about Guadalupe. 90% of families are headed by women. Because the men are absent. And that cannot be us. One of the key questions that God will ask you when you get to heaven is, where is your family? You brought them. Did you lead them towards God? Did you serve them so that they saw God in you? <coughs> we lead with our lives. We'll talk more about this in our next sessions. We lead by being authentic. Lead by your actions and by your inactions. You even lead by your failings. You know, you can even take your failings and use them as positive leadership. When you mess up, you go to your children and we say, I messed up, please will you forgive me? What we do when we do that is we show them the way to God and the way to eternal forgiveness through repentance. But when we refuse to take ownership, we model for them the way to hell. What about our wives and our marriages? This is a safe space. Jova promises to edit this little piece out of the video. Women are hard to understand. <laughs> you definitely have to edit out the fact that everybody giggled at that moment. <laughs> Sigmund Freud said after 30 years of studying women that he, had been, that he had been unable to answer the question, what does a woman want? <laughs> Many have settled in their marriages for a roommate or for a sexual partner. They seldom really talk anymore and they seldom laugh together. It's not that they're unhappy, they just don't really enjoy their wives. Other men are absent from their marriages. So busy conquering the world that when they get home, their petrol tanks are empty. Nothing left to offer when they get home. Biblical men, God's men, come home with gas in the tank to serve. They make an effort to be present and to lead and to serve their wives, no matter how complicated that is. I suspect that will probably mean lots of listening. You see, listening to her is 
like Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Perhaps the greatest tool in this regard is your evening meal. Use it as many nights as you can to build your family. Have a meal together. Converse. Lead the conversation towards God. Asking gentle questions. Be present. Be listening. Take interest. Contribute. Laugh. Cry. Fight. Sometimes. Serve always. What about church? Do you know that we could plant 20 churches right now, right this minute, if we had the leadership? We don't have the leaders. Come on, men. Eternity is at stake. Some of you are dreaming of retirement. I want to say to you that at the age of 65, I think you can make a massive difference for eternity. Here's what happens when you turn 65. You don't need a salary anymore. Your health is good. And you've got years of experience. What are you going to do with those three things? Play golf? Or invest in the 10 or 15 years, or whatever it is, the years that you've got left? To lead in the service of the kingdom of God and eternity. Lead by serving. Imagine an army of men going to their ministers and saying to them, Use me for the kingdom. I've got the time. Use me. Finally, let's talk about work. You know what your work situation is. Some of you are off to work tonight, on Monday. As a challenge, are you exercising leadership in your sphere of influence? Moving it towards God. You might be a laborer. You might be a teacher in a classroom. You might work in a factory or a warehouse. You might work in an office. You might even work at home. Whatever it is. You're a leader. Lead gently towards God. Always gently. Wisely like the God of wisdom. Graciously like Christ. Working as if God is there. Present. Making decisions that are kind and selfless. Serving others. Speaking of the Christ that you love. As our first word, biblical men lead. Let's pray. Our Father, will you give us hearts like yours? Would you give us desires like you? Give us energy that embraces our manliness. Give us love to serve. We dare to pray today that you would change the world through us. Would you mobilize today an army of servant leaders in KwaZulu Natal? Fathers who show the way to Christ. Business champions whose businesses are radically different. Husbands who serve their wives. Forgive our desire to be independent of you. Make us to be men who serve and lead for eternity, we pray. For Jesus' sake. Amen.